One of the important tasks when building a performance engine is to consider the balance of the internal components and there's a lot of misinformation about what involves balancing these components and how we go about it. So we're going to dive into a little bit of this information during this video. For a start what we need to understand is the components inside the engine where the balance is important and essentially this is anything that's actually moving inside the engine so we're considering here the pistons, the connecting rods, the crankshaft itself as well as the flywheel or flex plate, clutch cover and the front pulleys that are assembled onto the front of the crankshaft. Some of the balancing work we do need to leave to a professional engine machinist because balancing the crankshaft assembly specifically requires a balancing machine and this for a home enthusiast is going to be prohibitively expensive. So at best we're going to need to leave that part of the balancing job to an engine machinist. However, if you want to get a little bit more involved with your project there are some tasks that you can complete at home and this really comes down to balancing the pistons as well as the connecting rods. Fortunately the equipment that you're going to need to do this, particularly if you're only considering balancing the pistons, is actually really cheap, really cost effective. There's not a lot that you're going to need. Balancing the connecting rods simply because of the way they operate inside the engines is a little bit more involved because we need to separate out the big end mass of the rod from the overall mass of the connecting rod. I'll talk a little bit more about why in a moment. Another consideration before we dive into the actual balancing job as well is understanding the implications of the engine design you're working with. Now what I mean by this is if you're dealing with let's say an inline four cylinder engine then the way the piston and conrod operates inside the engine we essentially have two pistons and rods at top dead center and two at bottom dead center so the weight of the rods and the pistons actually cancel each other out so what this means from our perspective is that we can balance the pistons and the conrods independently of the crankshaft now that's not going to be the case if you're balancing let's say a V configuration engine maybe a V6 or a V8. Due to the way the piston and rods operate in a V configuration engine like this we need to actually take the weight of the piston and the conrod assembly into account when the machinist is balancing the crankshaft. Basically they run through a calculation to produce what's called a bob weight which is based on the weight of the pistons, the rods, the ring pack, even a allowance for the oil that's going to cling to the piston and the conrod and then this becomes a physical mass that's then attached to the crankshaft journals while the crankshaft is being balanced. So the implications of this is that while you can still balance your own pistons and rods, if you are going to be doing this you need to balance those components before you send them off to your machinist because obviously if you remove a gram of material after the machinist has gone through and balanced the crankshaft that's actually going to throw the whole operation out. So a few little intricacies we do need to understand. Let's dive in now and have a look at the components I've got laid out on the bench. So here we've got a set of CP pistons for a Nissan SR20 VE, obviously a four cylinder engine. Now it's not just the pistons that we are balancing though, it's everything associated with the pistons. So for example here I've got the wrist pin or gudgeon pins, we've also got the ring pack for each cylinder and we've even got the wire locks here which retain the wrist pin inside the piston. In most situations you can expect the weight of the different ring packs and wire locks and wrist pins to be relatively closely matched so normally we can disregard these. As you do quite often see a little bit of variation in the wrist pin weight but ring pack and wire locks generally they're going to be there or thereabouts but we also want to measure those and actually know that they are the same rather than making some assumptions otherwise it can throw out our overall balance. Now what equipment do we actually need to balance these components? The first thing we're going to need is a good quality set of scales. Now the ones that I'm using here are actually a Chinese brand and they're only around about 40 or 50 US dollars so they're surprisingly cheap for the consistency that they provide. It's important as well to just give some consideration to the uh, resolution of the scales. What we really want to be able to do is have a set of scales that will measure down to a tenth of a gram. Uh, the set of scales I just showed you actually measures down to a hundredth of a gram which is totally not necessary, that's complete overkill. We're not going to be balancing our components down to that sort of a tolerance so something that will measure down to a tenth of a gram particularly if you also want to be 
balancing your connecting rods, I'd suggest looking for a set of scales that will measure up to 2,000 grams or two kilograms. It'll give you capacity uh, when it comes to the conrod balancing fixture because you need to also be able to account for the weight of that fixture. The next tool that you're going to need in order to be able to balance your pistons is an air die grinder. Well, actually, a battery powered die grinder is also going to work. And this just allows you to accurately remove material from the piston. The one that I'm using here is a pneumatic air, air die grinder. And it's an important aspect here to consider the tool that you're going to be fitting into that die grinder. I've got a special aluminium burr or cutter tool and this uses a quite a coarse tooth profile and unlike a conventional carbide cutter that you use for ferrous materials the aluminium cutter won't end up getting clogged up while we're removing material from the piston. However because that's coarse it does require a little bit of finesse when we are massaging the piston weights down removing material because it's very easy to remove more material than you expected. So that's all you're going to need if you want to be balancing your pistons alone. However, if you want to balance your conrods, you're also going to need one other tool, which is a conrod balancing fixture. Let's take a look at that. This is a pretty typical conrod balancing fixture. This particular one is from Proform. And you can see that it includes a little adjustable stand here with a arm that hangs down on a roller bearing that supports the small end of the rod. The small end of the rod is also supported on roller, roller bearings here as well. There's the other part of the fixture here it supports the big end of the connecting rod. There's a mandrel in here that slips inside the big end of the rod and again that's supported on on roller bearings. The idea with that fixture is that we can now separate the weight of the big end of the connecting rod from the small end of the rod. Now why that's important is because of the way the connecting rod operates inside of the engine. Obviously the big end of the connecting rod is connected to the crankshaft, we've got the small end connected to the wrist pin inside the piston. So the big end is considered to be a rotating mass, the small end of the connecting rod is considered to be a reciprocating mass because it goes up and down. So that's why we need to actually separate out the small end and the big end masses when we are doing our balancing on the conrods and this does get a little bit more involved. It can be tempting to just weigh the overall connecting rod, find the lightest and remove material from the heaviest but that's not going to get us the result, we need to be a little bit more accurate with the process. Now on top of that balancing fixture and the scales of course, the die grinder is not going to be the tool of choice to remove material from the connecting rods in order to uh, fix any imbalance that you may have here. We're going to need to use a linisher and this is simply a large belt sander you could think of it as. It uses a linishing belt that is designed for removing material from ferrous materials, ferrous metals. So that makes it really quick and easy to remove material. We'll talk in a moment about where we should be removing that material as well because that's another important consideration. Now that we've got a bit of an understanding of what the process involves, we're actually going to go through and have a look at a set of pistons and the process of balancing them. I've got everything laid out here on the bench in front of me. And what we're going to do is start by just checking out the weight of our wire locks. So as I've mentioned, these should be pretty much all identical. So we just want to confirm that so that we can disregard that. So we'll get our scales turned on here and we'll allow those to zero themselves. And obviously we have two wire locks for each piston. So what we'll do is put two wire locks on there. I've chosen it at random. Wait for our scales to stabilize, 1.94 grams. Now you can see we are measuring down to a hundredth of a gram there. Not necessary, I'm still round to a tenth of a gram. 1.94, let's call it 1.9 grams. Put on our other two and we can see 1.93, so uh, one hundredth of a gram difference there. Still, we're rounding that 1.9. So we know that we can disregard our wire locks. Let's do the same now with our ring packs. So we'll just have a look at two ring packs here. So we'll put all of our rings on. Wait for our scales to stabilize again, 21.48. So we're gonna round that to 21.5 grams. Uh, we'll just choose a, another ring pack here from another piston, 
five zero this time. So two hundred hundredths of, the, of a gram difference there. But again, when we're rounding these to a tenth, they're exactly the same. So there we go. We've got those out of the equation. We know that we don't need to worry about our ring packs and our wire locks. That leaves us with our wrist pins and our pistons themselves. And again, you should expect or could rightly expect that the wrist pins will all be the same. But let's have a look and see how that pans out. So we'll place our wrist pin on our scales there. 98.36 98.32 98 98.38 and our last one 98.42 so around about a tenth of a gram difference there from lightest to heaviest there's a couple of ways we can deal with this. We'll see what is necessary once we have weighed our pistons. But what you can see here is I've actually laid these out as I've been weighing them from lightest at the bottom here to heaviest at the top. It is a very small amount of difference, but it's a difference nonetheless. Let's check out our pistons and see how those measure up. All right, so those pistons measuring up from a lightest at 304.2, we've got two pistons essentially sitting in there, 304.5, so there's actually only three tenths of a gram difference from heaviest to lightest, which actually straight out of the box is incredibly good. This is pretty unusual as well in my experience, either for an aftermarket piston or for a factory piston. Most of the manufacturers will have a tolerance, it might be somewhere around about plus or minus half a gram, so uh, we could expect our pistons to be slightly more out of balance. However, this is a pretty good place to start. Uh, again, I've spread these pistons out at the moment in order from lightest through to heaviest. Now what we can do here is start making some adjustments to our balance. There are no strict rules on how we can go about this. We already found out that our wrist pins have a small variation in weight between the lightest and the heaviest. So what we can do is choose to actually chamfer the end of the wrist pin itself. So what we'd be doing here is taking the heaviest one and using our die grinder to remove material from uh, inside the chamfer on the end of the wrist pin. Nothing wrong with that, it's not going to affect the strength of the wrist pin in that particular area but it is a very hard material so it's quite time consuming to remove that material. Also it gives us a little bit more work. My own personal preference is because we will always be keeping the wrist pins matched to the piston once it's run. I'm going to simply take our heaviest wrist pin here and I'm going to match that with our lightest piston and we'll go down the order like so. Now what we're going to do is measure the overall weight of the piston and the wrist pin and see how that small change has worked out. So let's go ahead and do that now. Alright so in our case we've still got an imbalance there, no big surprise given the very small difference in the weight between our wrist pins. However in some instances that variation is going to be more dramatic than that and it's a nice little trick just to get you closer to the ballpark before you start removing material from the pistons. In our case here we've got a three tenth of a gram variation. That's not a lot so this is a good time to talk about what sort of tolerances should you be working with, what is your aim across the pistons. Again there's no black and white here, there's no real strict answer that you must follow. A lot of it's going to come down to the application specifically as well. An imbalance becomes more critical as the RPM ceiling increases. So for a low RPM engine that's only revving to maybe five, maybe 6,000 RPM, maybe a gram of imbalance is absolutely fine for your particular application. Probably a little bit larger than what I'd be targeting but hopefully you get the idea. If we're building an engine that's going to rev to 10 or 11,000 RPM, I'm going to want to tighten up that tolerance significantly. Now generally as a good guide if we're within about half a gram of imbalance across our set of pistons that's going to be a pretty good place to be. Personally because I'm fussy and because it really doesn't take any more time to work to a tighter tolerance I'll generally try and be within about plus or minus a tenth of a gram. Now I know we cop a little bit of flack on the internet when we talk about such tight tolerances and fair enough but let me explain. We've had a lot of people say to us well what's the point of working to within a tenth of a gram in balance when the weight of the oil that's actually going to be clinging to the piston in operation will probably have a bigger effect and that's totally reasonable. 
However, I like to work on the basis of controlling the things that are within my control. I cannot control the amount of oil that's going to be cleaned to the piston and the connecting rod in operation, but I can control the static weight of those parts. And again, when we're getting out our die grinder and we're actually removing material from the pistons, it takes no more time to work to a tolerance of plus or minus half a gram as it does to work to a tolerance of plus or minus a tenth of a gram. Well, obviously it takes a little bit more time, but hopefully you get what I'm talking about. You're already there, you've already got the equipment laid out. Why not spend the extra five minutes and control the things that are within your control as tightly as you can? This then leads to the next obvious question, where should we be removing this material? And this really comes down to the individual piston design. There's no specific area that's going to work in every application. It requires using a little bit of common sense, inspecting the piston and seeing where we can get away with removing material so that we can reduce the weight of the heavier pistons down to match our lightest piston without impacting on the strength of the piston. So let's have a look at our CP piston here. And we'll see where we could reasonably expect to remove material. So you can see this is a full round design, so we've got a full round skirt. First thing to note is we are not going to be touching the crown of the piston, we're not going to be touching the skirt. Any of the work we're going to be doing to remove weight or material from the piston is going to be done on the underside and also on the internal area of the underside of the piston. So it gives us a fairly big scope to work with here. What we can see on these CP pistons is the pin bosses have these little bulges at all four corners and if we turn the piston over slightly we can see that there's actually quite a large cross section of material between the pin boss and this little bulge on our forging. So for me, if I'm needing to remove a small amount of material, which in this case, if we're trying to work within a tenth of a gram, we're already within three tenths, there's not a lot required. I'd be starting by using my die grinder on these four little points on the underside of the piston. It's also important here, we want to remove as little material as we can from as many parts as we can. So basically we're having a little minimal impact on the material we are removing, we're doing this evenly. So instead of concentrating the two tenths of material I need to remove from just one spot like this part here, I'd be removing a very small amount of material from all four of these locations. And again, this just gets us where we need to be without impacting the strength of the piston. Now if we needed to remove a little bit more material, the other thing I'd like to do here is just chamfer uh, this wide section between the pin boss and where it connects to the skirt. We can remove a nice amount of material here with a gentle chamfer, again without impacting on the strength of the piston. Areas that we don't want to touch, I've already talked about the, the crown of the piston and the skirt, we also want to stay away from the underside of the piston crown. And the reason for this is the thickness of material there is really critical to the strength of the piston. And if we remove material, let's say by drilling the underside of the piston crown, yes I have actually seen that being done, what we're going to end up doing is creating a potential stress raiser, as well as the fact that we are thinning out the crown of the piston, and in a high performance application that's going to lead to the potential of a failure at that point. So that's the process we go through to weigh our pistons, match them as well as we can with the components we're working with and then where we actually need to remove material when we're doing so. Of course it goes without saying as well that when we are removing material we want to make small adjustments and check our work frequently. It's easy to remove more material if the piston's still a little bit heavy but it's very difficult to add material back in if you find that you've removed too much and your piston is now weighing light. So work slowly, methodically and check your work frequently. We'll now have a quick look at our connecting rod and see whereabouts we should be removing material from the rod when we are going about our balancing and this is an aspect that I actually see a lot of professional engine machinists actually get wrong as well which can be a little bit concerning. Let's look at our demo rod here and this is an Argo I-beam connecting rod that we just use for display purposes. It's a fairly chunky rod as you can see here. Now, when we are balancing the big end here, we obviously need to remove material from here. And one of the common areas I see material being removed from is these ribs on the back of the cap. Now, granted this is an easy place to remove the material, so I understand why people would want to do this. The problem is that those ribs there are actually really important. Those are there to improve the rigidity of the rod cap. 
When we grind those down using our linisher, we're actually weakening the rod cap, allowing it to flex. And again, particularly in a high RPM application, uh, that can distort it, can create problems with reliability. So that's a big no-no. We don't want to remove material there. Much like our pistons, instead what we're trying to do is find an area on the rod where we can safely remove material obviously without impacting on the strength of the rod and that's going to be a little different on every design of rod but in the case of our Argo I-beam rods here we've got a good amount of material here on the side of the cap and the main body of the rod that is adjacent or parallel to where our rod bolts run. So what we can do there is use our linisha to add a chamfer, you can actually see I've done exactly this on this rod, and remove material on these four edges. Just like with our pistons, the key when we are removing material from the rods is to check our work frequently so that we're only removing the bare minimum amount of material to get our rods to our balance point without going too far. Obviously a consideration here, if you're balancing your pistons and your rods at the same time, the density of the materials significantly different. What this means is that for the alloy and the pistons, you're going to need to remove a larger amount of material in order to influence the balance or the weight of the piston compared to a 4340-4130 chromoly connecting rod. So that's a consideration there. You build up a bit of a feel for this as you remove material and check how much that's actually affected the balance. Now let's talk about the small end of the rod. Once we've balanced all of the big ends to the, of the rods to our lightest, the next process is to measure the overall weight of the rod. And this time what we're going to do is find the lightest rod. Any rods that are heavier than that, the imbalance is obviously now at the small end, so we need to remove material there. So rather than focusing our linisher in one place, it's going to be a process of smoothly moving the small end of the rod around our linisher, making sure that we're evenly removing material. Again, getting the bare amount of material removed to do the job. It's also important when we are using our linisher like this that we don't stay in one place for too long. This can actually overheat the material in the rod, which can affect its strength as well. Now it might all sound a little bit complex, and the reality is there's no need for you to balance your own components. If you're not comfortable with any of that, you can absolutely leave the job to your engine machinist. However, with a minimal amount of equipment that you need to set up, it is actually really easy to do this work at home yourself. It can save you a little bit of money compared to what your engine machinist is likely to charge for that work and personally, I don't know if it's just me, I find it quite satisfying knowing that I've got those parts balanced as accurately as I can. Last thing I want to just talk about here is the scales that I've used. Now I mentioned that these are a relatively cheap item sourced out of China and you might be thinking well how can a set of scales that are so cheap possibly be any good? Now, of course these days there are some pretty good products coming out of China at a really uh, competitive price point. Some of the more sophisticated scales that are typically used for engine balancing would probably be in the range of three to five hundred US dollars, even upwards of a thousand US dollars if you want to get uh, really, really good quality scales. What we do need to understand though, for our purposes, the what we're looking for out of our scales is not specifically being able to measure down to the exact tenth of a gram or hundredth of a gram compared to a reference weight. We don't really care that much about whether the value that the scales are showing us is a true representation of the weight of the component. Now that might sound weird, but bear with me. It's much more important that we are choosing a set of scales that is repeatable and what I mean by this is that if we put the same item on our set of scales 10 times, ideally we want exactly the same number to come up on our scales 10 times. In this way it doesn't really matter if our scales are measuring in grams, pounds or fluffy unicorns. What we want to know is that every time we put the component on the scales we're getting exactly the same value. Now things are a little bit different for our engine machinist though. When the engine machinist is balancing the crankshaft and they're calculating a bob weight, at that point the specific weight is actually important but for our purposes it isn't. If you like that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.